Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. So today we're going to be finishing our series on the book of Romans. I've been going back and forth with Pastor Mike each week. If you haven't seen up into this sermon, I strongly recommend go back and watch parts one to three. Like, you don't want to start a Netflix series at the season finale. You want to, you know, work all the way through. So I want to encourage you, go back and watch those messages. But today in Romans 8, I'm going to come from it at a little bit of a different perspective. We spent the first three weeks saying, here is what the scripture is saying about this truth. So in Romans chapter 8, it's very, very clear that we see that there's this idea of there's struggles within us and there's also good things and there's bad things going on in the world. And today I want us to answer the question, does God cause evil things in our lives so that good can come from it? You might have heard things like if you were in a car accident or you had broken a bone or there's a very difficult time in your life. You might have heard somebody say, hey, God's doing that to you. You just got to trust him. God's the one that caused that car accident in your life. You've just got to trust him. Today I want us to think about this idea. Does God cause evil in the lives of his children to bring about some sort of good? And one Bible verse that is usually quoted around this topic is Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that for those who love God, that all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Let's pray today. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to hear your word. God, I thank you that you watch over your word to perform it, that it will accomplish the thing for which you are sending it. And I thank you for these things. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So to illustrate my point today, I want to go ahead and start by telling you a story. So when I was in high school, I was very involved on the soccer team. I started playing at the age of six and up throughout my career. I played travel from the ages of six to 15 And then from the ages of 12 to 17, I was involved in middle school and high school soccer. So my travel coach ended up being my high school coach. And one thing that he always taught us from a young age is I need every person on the field to be ready to play in any position. So my primary position was I was a goalkeeper, but I had the knowledge and the skills to play in any position on the field. So one day when I was playing goalkeeper in a high school game, it's pretty much boring. As a goalie, you do nothing for 99% of the game. And then there's about 10 seconds where you can be a hero or you can be a zero. (laughs) When the score ends two to one in a sport and you let in two goals, the bus ride home was like, for real, Josh. You had one job. You couldn't stop one or the two. You at least get a tie, right? So we have this moment in the soccer game where the ball comes into the box and I run forward and I slide to get my hands onto the ball. And the opponent on the other team, he goes to kick the ball, he misses the ball, and he catches me right on my wrist. Wham! And I get up and I'm like, "Uh uh-uh, coach, coach, I'm done. My wrist is done. So one thing you need as a goalkeeper, you need a range of motion. So coach says, all right, put your hands up. And I was able to put one hand up, and my left hand, I was like a T-Rex. I was like, he's like, come on, stretch your arm. I'm like, coach, I can't. So he asked me, he's like, can you finish the game? I was like, I think so. So he wraps up my arm. He gets me back into the game, and he puts me in this position of center back or center defense. So one problem we were having that year was that other teams would kick the ball over our defense, and they would run, and they would just grab the ball. We didn't have anybody fast in defense. And one thing that you need to know about me is I know it looks like my legs start here. My legs actually start right here on my body. I have to get custom clothes to make it look like my legs aren't the entire length of my torso. And because I have these long legs, I could cross the field in two steps. I can make it from here to the parking lot in four steps if I needed to because of my long legs. 
And we're going throughout the soccer season. And as my arm got better, I was ready to go back to goal. But coach said, uh-uh. You're going to be playing defense for the rest of the year. I had injured my arm. It was a bad situation. But my coach was able to take that bad situation and bring something good out of it. But let me ask you something. Did my coach break my arm? No. Did my coach want me to hurt myself? Did my coach wish evil upon my life? No. So let me ask you this. If we understand that our earthly coaches would never want evil on our life, why do we assume that our heavenly coach would send us evil? If we understand that our natural people who aren't perfect by any means would never wish evil upon somebody, why do we think some of us that God would wish evil upon his children? I want you to understand something today, that God is good and Satan is evil. As simple as it sounds, God is good and Satan is evil. The same way that my coach was not stopped in this situation by the injury that I had to my arm, we need to understand that God is not stopped by the evil things going on in our lives. That there is no evil that can overcome the light of God's plan for us. And this is a small distinction, and we're going to really use this lens going into the book of Romans, that there is a massive difference between, between saying that God causes evil versus saying that God's plan is not stopped by evil. It's a huge difference to say that God causes evil versus God is faithful in the midst of the evil in this world. We felt it at this weekend. I was talking with the youth director and some of the other leaders. This entire weekend legitimately felt like a four-day spiritual battle. It was like at every corner, something was trying to pop up. And we spent so much time in prayer going into that weekend. And I can definitely see why. Would I think for one second that God was sending demons or God was sending a spiritual attack on the students? Absolutely not. But what I do know is that God was faithful to change the lives of students in the midst of what was going on. This is the God that we serve. And we see in Romans 8.28, it talks about the purpose of God. It says, and we know that for those who love God, that all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Some people have read this scripture to mean that God is causing evil in my life. I want you to know that God is not causing evil. But that in the midst of evil, in the midst of difficulty, that God still has a purpose for your life. The God that we serve is the author of all things good. Say that with me. Say, God is the author of good. What I mean by that is not just that God is good by human standards. Because we have to understand that God was good before humanity ever was created. That God's goodness goes beyond creation. That good is not something that God just does. It is his very being, his very nature. This is the God of scripture. In James chapter 1 verse 17 it says that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And reading that verse, it kind of feels like that ending is out of, out of, out of, it doesn't belong there. Okay, every good and perfect gift is from God, but what does God not changing have anything to do with that verse? It's one thing to say that God is good. It's another thing to say he cannot change. In other words, there is never a moment where we need to doubt that God is good. There is never a time when we need to think, is God going to change up on me? Who here has ever met somebody that's changed up on you? Wave at me real quick. And I'm going to wave back because I've changed up on people many times before. And it's not a good feeling to not know what to expect with somebody, right? You might have met someone where you don't know which coworker you're going to see today. 
That is not the God we serve. He does not change. In 1 John 1.5, it says this. This is the message that we have heard from God and proclaimed to you. That God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There is no darkness in the God that we serve. If you feel like there's legitimately darkness that is trying to creep into your life, I want you to understand today that it is not from our God. We used to have this phrase when I was in kids ministry called 1 John 1, 9 it. We say, if you mess up, just 1 John 1, 9 it. It says, confess your sins to God and he is faithful to forgive you. Well, today, if there's evil in your life, I want you to 1 John 1, 5 it. Remind yourself that there is no evil in the God that we serve. And with God as the author of good, I want this to be the lenses that we now read this book of Romans through. Everybody say lenses. Lenses are pretty much the filter through which you read something. So if there's one of the students standing in front of me, and someone tells, you, tells me this student is a problem student, this student doesn't listen, this student has no hope for the future, and I wear the lens that says that this student has no value, what am I going to see in that student? I'm going to see that they have no value. But if everybody says the same things about this student, but I'm wearing the lens of what God says about them, that they're created in God's image, that they have a purpose, that they have a calling, that God's not done with them, then I'm going to see the gifting that God placed on the inside of them. But what I see is going to change based upon the lenses that I'm wearing. And the same is true for Scripture. That if we read Scripture with the lens that God is evil, guess what we're going to see? That God is evil. But if we read it through the lens that God is good, we're going to accurately see that we serve a good God. And this is how I want us to understand Romans chapter 8. So in verses 18 to 25, the Apostle Paul is laying out to this church in Rome that there are present sufferings that are not going to compare with the glory that we see eventually. In verse 18, it says, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. He's speaking here. He's saying, listen, there's struggles in this life. There's difficult moments in this life. But the struggles that we're facing right now, they don't even compare to the glory that we're going to see one day. The difficulty and the pain that we're feeling right now are not going to come close to the glory that we're going to see in the future. He's not saying that God causes the struggles. He's not saying that God wills the struggles in your life. He's saying there is a struggle now in this life, but we have a greater hope that is found in Jesus Christ. Now, here's the hard part about that. We hear things like there will be no more tears in heaven, but God, I was just crying last night. We hear things like, There's no suffering in heaven, but God, I'm suffering right now. I'm sitting here in a church service, suffering, listening to a message as I'm sitting here. We hear things like, we're going to see our loved ones in heaven one day, but that doesn't make me miss them any less right now. And there's this tension that's called the right now, but the not yet. This tension is right now, there's a struggle. But at the same time, right now, we have victory in Jesus. And then there's the not yet. That there are things, there are promises that we're going to see one day when we're united with God. But it's not aligning with what I'm seeing right now. So this question that we ask is, I understand there's a future hope, but what is God doing right now? I understand that there's a future glory, but God, I need you right now. Where is God in the middle of my struggles? Verse 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. In the same way, the Spirit 
helps us in our weakness. When we don't know what we ought to pray for, the Spirit of God himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Now let me ask you something. What is prayer? Prayer is talking to, is talking to God. So in those moments when we don't know what we should talk to God about, when we don't know what we ought to pray, the Bible is saying here that the Spirit of God is stepping in on our behalf and praying for us. Now this might seem like it's a small detail, but this is a massive truth that we see right here. That even when we don't have the strength to do what we ought to do, that God is going to step in on our behalf. Now, we live in a, a day and age where it's, it's natural, it's fair, that we want to care for those who care for us. That we want to invest in those who invest in us. But the God that we serve says that even when we don't have the strength to do what we ought to do, that he's not going to abandon us. That he's going to step in on our behalf. When we look at the word that the spirit intercedes for us, it is literally the idea that the spirit is meeting with God on our behalf. It's like a student that's getting in trouble a lot in school and the parent is going to the principal on their behalf. And they're vouching for their student on their behalf. It's in those moments where we're feeling weak, where we feel like we ought to be praying, but we don't know what to say, that God steps in on our behalf. Verse 27, and he, or and God, who searches our hearts, knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Now, one thing we're learning in Bible school is when a phrase or a concept is repeated over and over and over again in a passage, it's the writer's way of saying this is very important. So over and over again, we're seeing in here, it's talking about the will of God, the calling of God, the purpose of God. We see that this, this passage is centered around God's purpose for us, and we see that in the moments when we can't even pray, in the moments when we're not sticking to our purpose, that the Spirit of God will meet with God or intercede on our behalf. And you might be saying, well, why is that important today? How, how can I visualize this? We see this in the Old Testament with Abraham and this thing called a covenant. Everybody say covenant. Now what a covenant is, is it's kind of like a contract. When we sign a contract, we have two people, so party A and party B, they'll sign the contract. And when they sign that contract, within that contract, it will say, if either party violates one of these rules, the contract no longer applies. The contract is null and void. So we see with God and Abraham in the book of Genesis that he makes this contract with Abraham. He makes this covenant with Abraham. And in the Old Testament, it was done through a blood sacrifice. Covenants were done through sacrifice. We see that the new covenant comes through the sacrifice of Jesus. It's a shadow of what God was doing. And when we look at this covenant of Abraham, Abraham goes and he gets the animals for the sacrifice. Abraham, in all of his human strength, stands before God and he says, God, here is everything for the covenant. And now it's time for them to sign the contract, to sign the covenant. And you know what the Bible says happened next? Abraham, he passes out. He drops. It says that a deep sleep falls upon him. And while Abraham is fast asleep, God makes a covenant to Abraham between him and himself. Now what is the significance of that? In this contract, in this covenant that just happened, God is signing both lines of the contract because he will never violate his own word. And the same is true for the promises of God that he has given to us. The promises aren't dependent on us behaving right because who knows we're going to mess it up. Give me about 30 seconds. I'll mess up any contract. Give me about 15 seconds to do the opposite of what God is instructing. But God knows that God will never violate his own terms. That God will never violate his own contract. 
So we see that when the Spirit of God is meeting with God the Father on our behalf, that they're signing a contract that we can never fulfill on our own. So we can understand that even in those moments when we are weak, that God is still faithful to his word. So the Apostle Paul is laying out this foundation for us as we're understanding this text. In verses 18 to 25, we see that he's outlining this future hope that we have in God. In verses 26 and 27, he's saying, in your right now moments of weakness, God is interceding for you or praying for you. And then watch what happens in the next part. In Romans 8, chapter 28, it says, And we know that for those who love God, that all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So he talks in 18 to 25 about the current struggles and the future hope. 26 and 27, we see that God is right there with us in the midst of the difficulties. And then he says, for those who are called according to God's purpose, all things work out for our good. In other words, God's purpose for your life is not limited by your weakness. God's plan for your life is not dependent on you not being weak. Because if it was dependent on us, who knows we're going to mess it up. But because it's dependent on him, there is no struggle that we can go through that is too big for God's plan for our lives. There is no mistake that you can make that will violate God's purpose and plan for your life. See, some of you see all the failures of your past. And you say, because of these failures, God can never use me. But God says, because of your failures, you're exactly the person that I need to fulfill this calling. The person that's writing this letter to the Romans, his name was the Apostle Paul. It is believed that he was a killer of Christians. He was definitely an approval, he had definitely approved the killing of Christians. But if anybody was to know the struggle of dealing with the past, it would be a man that murdered Christians now writing letters to them saying, you got to trust God. How difficult must that be? But the Apostle Paul, he understood that God's purpose for his life was not dependent on his past mistakes. It was dependent on him. And he was called according to God's purpose. And I think in this verse, we've spent so much time focusing on the idea that things will work together for our good, that we completely forget the concept that it is centered around God's purpose for our lives. I want you to know today that God's purpose for your life factored in every mistake. It factored in every wrongdoing. It factored in every cuss word. It factored in every addiction. It factored in every time you curse God's name and yet he still loves and calls you. This is the God that we serve. He gives us a purpose in our weakness. And that's my idea I want to communicate today, that God creates our purpose, not us. That God creates our purpose, not us. Every single baby in the nursery right now has a purpose on their life from God. And the babies didn't meet with God and say, um, all right, God, we're going to start with Gerber. We're going to move into preschool. Wait, don't forget about the terrible twos, Lord. We're going to hit there real, a little bit. And then I'm going to go to this high school and I'm going to go to this college. No. The babies have done nothing to earn or deserve a purpose, yet each one has a call on their life from God. And what is the significance of that? If the babies have a purpose, then guess what this room also has? A purpose. So the fact that every person in this room has a purpose... And although we face difficult situations, we can understand that God has factored everything in to our calling. And the next question we have to ask is, okay, what 
is that purpose? What is God's purpose for my life? It's in the very next verse. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now, some of you are here, and you hear me go, duh, duh. And you say, why is he acting like a black preacher? It is a black church? What an organ. What I'm doing is highlighting that all of that was in the past tense. Glorified, justified, called, predestined. Those are all in the past tense. So follow what the Apostle Paul is doing here. In verses 18 to 25, he talks about our future hope in Jesus. In verses 26 and 27, he talks about the Spirit being with us right now in the moments of weakness. And in verses 29 and 30, he's talking about the finished work of the cross. Can you now see how all things work together for the good of those who love God? That our past, our present, and our future are covered by his grace. So now when we understand that every part of time is covered by God's goodness, we can see that how is God working all things together for my good? That there is something we couldn't do called the cross. And what did God do on the cross because we couldn't? He sent his son. There's moments of weakness when we don't know what we ought to pray. And what does God do? He sends his spirit to intercede for us. And then there's a future glory where we will be con um, conformed into the image of the son. And guess what? That's not about us. That's about God. So the same way with Abraham, how we see that God signs both parts of the covenant, we see in our lives that the cross that God did the work. That in our current weaknesses, that the Spirit is doing the work. And in the future glory, that God is doing the work. We see that all things work together for those who love God. Not because of what we can do, but because of what He can do. This is the gospel message. It's not about our abilities. It's all about what God can do. And there's this little line, for those who love God. That's because this verse does not apply to everybody. This passage is not written to everybody. This passage is written for those that place their faith in Jesus Christ. The reality is that we have hope in the future because of Jesus there is no hope in the future apart from God. There is no finished work in the past apart from God. There is no spirit interceding for us right now when we ought to pray apart from God. This was written to God's people. We have this hope that we shall be conformed to the image of the Son. And in Colossians 3.9, it says, Do not lie to one another. Seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Do you see how over and over again, how the Bible in these passages is pointing us back to Jesus? How it's pointing to how we shall be like him? How in the midst of this whole passage, there is really nothing that we can do in our own strength to make it happen. But God has signed both parts of the contract and he is faithful to his word. So we see that God has got our past, our present, and our future in his hands. So what do we do? What role do we play? Well, the first thing I want to say is change your question. Change your question. We have wrote, made Romans 8, 28 all about how is God going to benefit me 
in this situation, instead of saying, what is God doing in me in this situation? It's all about what can I get as opposed to saying, what is God giving to me? When we focus on what we can do, what we can do in our strength in this negative situation, it's never going to work out. Because if we're putting our faith and our confidence in ourselves, I can speak for me. i failed more than enough times to know. Bad idea. But I've also seen God be faithful over and over and over again to know, you know what? Even though I can't do it, I know a God who can. Even though I don't have a strength, I know the God that does. Even though I can't provide in this situation, I know the God that is a provider. Even though I can't heal myself, I know the God who is a healer. Whatever circumstance you are in right now, it is not just something to tear you down. It is an opportunity to see the living God at work in your life. I was reading this book named Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he's talking all about how we can make small habits to give us huge results in our lives. And looking at this sermon in Romans, it would be like me saying, all right, here's all the things I can do to be a good Christian. And I'm excited by this book, Atomic Habits. I say, I'm going to form all these habits. This writer, James Clear, he gives you all the power of habits. And I'm like, I'm going to start with this habit right now. I don't even need to read the second half of this book. I'm good. And then I flip to the next page, and this guy, James Clear, he says, never start with the habits. I'm like, James, come on, dog. I was excited. Now I want to burn your book. He says, never start with what you want to do. Start with who you want to be like. Never start with the steps that you're going to take. Start with the image of the one that you want to be like. That person in Christianity is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ who we can fix our eyes on. The Bible says he is the author, beginning, and finisher, end of our faith. That God is not just the God of the middle, but he's the God of the future and the God of our past. When we fix our eyes on the person of Jesus that we are to follow, naturally we're going to change our question. Jesus didn't ask, how is this going to benefit me? He said, Father, if you can, take this cup of crucifixion from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That is the creator that we follow after. When we change the questions that we ask from all about me to all about him, it's a completely different set of lenses that we see this walk with God through. And I want to end today by talking to the people that the Apostle Paul was trying to reach. For those of you who are in the middle of a difficult situation, for those of you who might have lost hope, I want to encourage you today to reach out and to take a hold of hope. To reach out and to seize hope. A lot of times you might get this image that this walk with God, that we just sit back and that God's going to do it all. And we just fold our arms and we just wait. But I think a lot of times it's almost like God is holding out the platter in front of us. And he's saying, what do you need in this moment? To the woman with the issue of blood, Jesus was the healer. To Lazarus, Jesus Christ was the resurrection and the life. For us, Jesus is whatever we need him to be in those situations. Not because of our will, but because of his will. You might be saying, you know what, Jesus, I need you to strike down everybody at my job. Eleven people told me I was being rude to customers, and that's the devil. I mean, 
maybe you the devil in this situation. It's considering 11 people are trying to tell you. But what we understand in this walk with God is that according to his will, that there are certain things that he has for us. And sometimes all we got to do is reach out and seize it. So I want to encourage you, if you've lost hope today, reach out and grab on to hope. If you're dealing with a teenager and you're just about ready to quit, I want you, do not give up hope. Reach out and seize that hope. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Of things hoped for. The conviction of things not yet seen. If we were to write this out in the order that it happens logically, we see that there is hope and then there is assurance. And together we call that faith. We've got to start with a sense of hope. If you feel today like there's no hope for your future, if you feel like there's no assurance for your future, like the struggles are overwhelming you, I want to encourage you to reach out and grab hope. Can we all reach out our hands today? Reach out an open hand. Reach out an open hand. And I want everyone to close their eyes and think of an area where you've given up or you've lost hope. And what I'm going to do is we're going to take a moment and we're going to pray. And I want you in that moment as I'm praying, begin to feel that hope is rising up on the inside. And when I say amen, I want you to grab a hold of it by faith. Father, I come to you today in Jesus' name. And Lord, I pray for anybody in this room that has lost hope. Father, I thank you in the name of Jesus that hope begins to rise in this room. I thank you, Holy Spirit, if there's anybody in a moment of weakness where they don't even know what they ought to pray, God, that right now that the Holy Spirit is interceding on their behalf. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you rise up on the inside of every believer, that by faith we can say without a shadow of a doubt, in the name of Jesus, I have hope. In the name of Jesus, I have a future. In the name of Jesus, I have new life. And God, by faith, we thank you for the assurance of these things. In Jesus' name, amen, and grab that hope. If you're here today and maybe you've never even placed your hope in Jesus, I want to encourage you to pray this prayer that we all pray together where we are simply acknowledging that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died and he rose again for our sins. It goes like this. Dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart, come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that, and you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.